Welcome to episode 35 of Inside Politics, for teens by teens, where I explore the politics and issues impacting a generation. I'm your host, Christina Lee, and today I'm focusing on political investigative journalism. For this, I've invited Sarah Kleiner, reporter at the Center for Public Integrity. Sarah, how are you doing today? I'm great, how are you? I'm good, thank you so much for asking. So let's jump right in. So how do you pick a story to cover, given that there are so many more stories than journalists? That's a great question. It's, it can be very difficult um, to pick the right story. So I try to pick stories that have a, an impact on a whole lot of people um, instead of just a small group of people. And I try to look for um, things that are, I, I would Call them like systemic problems, problems with the system, problems that are so widespread um, that, and, and maybe a government organization isn't doing their job by overseeing properly, or this is some, there's an issue in the law, and some people are able to do things that, um, that they shouldn't be doing. And I, I am thinking of one specific example of something that I really zeroed in on um, in my time at the Center for Public Integrity. And that is charity fraud and the, the people, the fundraisers who work for the charity. And they are basically raising a lot of like hundreds of millions of dollars from unsuspecting Americans and um, Americans who think they're doing good, who think they're helping kids with cancer or police officers or firefighters um, or veterans. But in actuality, most of the money has stayed with uh, telemarketers and uh, and the charity operators. I see. So how long does it take to write an investigative article from start to finish and what's the process like? Uh, another great question. It can take uh, it can take a very long time for investigative journalism. It doesn't have to. It can be there there can be investigative stories that are turned around in say a matter of weeks. But the story uh, that I was referencing earlier about the, the major telemarketer based in Las Vegas, um, that story took me, I think it was about a year from oh, start wow. to finish. Now, I was working on other things in the meantime, but uh, from the time when I started doing research to the time when it published, it was about a year. I see. So I guess what steps go into, um, like, from start to finish? So for that story, I started you always kind of want to start broad and you start kind of like with the outside circle of whatever you're reporting. So if I'm, I know that eventually I'm going to want to get to this Las Vegas telemarketer who's made hundreds of millions of dollars raising money for charities that he's kept. Um, if I want to get to that guy, I got to start way out here. You start by looking at court records and you start by researching, um, has he been sued? Has he sued anyone? And sure enough, yes, he had, he had been sued and he had sued people. Um, and then you get a little bit smaller and you start to call, um, you do uh, research where you look at, um, well, how much money has he raised and how much of that has he kept? And then you go to, you move in and you get a little closer and you talk to his family members and his business associates. And you interview those people and you ask, what is this guy like? Um, what, what are his motivations? And, um, and, then you, and then you talk to the um, regulators about, you know, it's against a lot of mislead donors about how their money is gonna be used. So how has this guy been able to operate? And you ask them those questions. And then eventually you get to the guy at the center. And so I flew out to Las Vegas and I, uh, I, you know, I had his address. I went to his house. It was behind this humongous wall. Um, couldn't get in. Couldn't even ring the doorbell uh, because he had a huge gate. And so then uh, I went to his place of business and walked in, identified myself as a reporter with the Center for Public Integrity. And then he, he came out from the back office and got very angry at me and told me to leave and said he was going to call the police. And then so I said, okay, I'm leaving. And I walked out and he followed me into the parking lot and said he was going to get my license plate number. So it was really like, it was very contentious. It was very stressful. 
But I came back and I wrote the story and it was a, a lengthy story, but um, in the end, it really like it got a lot of people talking about how is this legal? How is this going on? So it, it affected a lot of people and it was a systemic problem. So that those are kind of the things that I look for. Oh, wow. So I guess like I would have never thought that there was like that much on the ground work going on. So like, is that a thing that happens a lot where you actually have to go and like find the people that you're writing about? Absolutely. Yes. And throughout my career, I found that sometimes the kind of people that you write about don't want to be found. So it's hard to get phone numbers. Uh, sometimes it's, you know, they've got like their house is they bought a house, but it's in the name of a trust. So when you look up the property records, you, it's hard to find their address. So I've had to do a lot of digging in my past where I've tracked people down and I end up going in person a lot because I feel like if they're not picking up the phone, if they're not returning my calls, they don't want to talk to me about, um, there's a, another, there's a guy who, when I worked at the Virginian pilot, he was a financial advisor and he was basically convincing older ladies to give him lots and lots of, lots of money to these sham companies. And, um, I, I could not for the life of me track him down. I, I flew to Florida to find him. Um, and I found his business as associate, but I didn't find him. There's another guy in, uh, when I was at the Virginian pilot who again, wouldn't return my phone calls. And I wound up going to his house. That was honestly a mistake. I, I went by myself and no one knew where I was. I wouldn't do this again. Um, so, and that was also like a very contentious interview. That was, uh, he was very unhappy with me um, for being there. So I find that if I have, if I run out of options and they're not calling me back, I mean, you always have to talk to the person at the center of your story. Like you have to talk to, you have to get their side of the story. It's only fair. Um, but sometimes, you know, they just don't want to answer questions. So you just got to go track them down. Understood. So I guess like that sounds pretty stressful. And I guess like it also, I guess might also be stressful if you get backlash from your articles, if that's ever happened. Does that happen? Yes, definitely. I mean, there are people who, it, usually when you're writing something, there's at least two sides to the story, possibly more. And you do your very best to make sure every single side, every aspect is covered in your story so that it's fair and accurate. Um, but there are times when people are still very unhappy with the work that you do. And, you know, they'll reach out and write you angry emails. Um, an example, uh, I, I had a phone call from a police officer in Las Vegas who was part of that telemarketing ring that was raising money for kids with cancer, but not spending it on kids with cancer. The police officer who was running that organization that contracted with the telemarketer, um, I wrote about him and he wound up quitting the department and he sent me an email and he told me to rot in hell. So, I mean, you know, it, yeah, you, you get backlash from people, but it's part of, I mean, that's part of, it's part of the job. Mm -hmm. Have you ever, I guess, like, second-guessed your decision to just, like, keep going with this work because of the backlash? Uh, not because of the backlash. I have second-guessed my decision to keep going, I guess, because reporting on negative uh, news and systemic problems over time, it, it can kind of wear on you. So, yeah, I... I do what I do because I love it and I feel like I feel very driven to do this. Um, but it can, it can wear you down. Um, and it can just like, especially if you're doing investigative reporting, you're typically not writing any of the stories that are about like uh, puppies and kittens and babies and that sort of thing. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it, it can definitely wear on you. Yeah. So do you think like your work has made you more cynical and like has it affected your like view of society? <laughs> yes and yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah, I think journalists like in, in general are just a cynical bunch. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, you should hear that it's a lot of dark humor in the newsrooms um, because that's how we cope with what we do day after day. Um, my kid mm -hmm. is going to make an appearance here. Um, she uh sorry she's sitting here um yeah and i and i do think 
I think it's important to remember that for every troll, that you're not doing this, there are trolls out there and they're going to be mean to you and they're gonna say nasty things to you on Twitter. Um, but there, for every person like that, there is someone out there who needs, who needs to know this information, who is, i.e. I. being scammed, who is like an older lady. I mean, I talked to this woman in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, and she was rummaging through all of these papers in her kitchen. And she was reading off to me the names of all these charities that were asking her for money. She had sent tens of thousands of dollars out to fake charities. So it's like, that's why you have to focus on those people. You have to focus on the reason why you're doing this and try to tune out the, the nastiness and the, and the people who call you fake news and the people who say you're an enemy of the people. You just have to try to tune that out as best you can. It, it can be pretty tough. Mm -hmm. So I was talking to Dave because um, he referred you and he said that few reporters have so much empathy in their writing. And so I guess like at first glance, I, I'm not sure if I'd like think of investigative journal, journalism as something that like requires empathy, but I guess like how do you end up imbuing empathy in your work? So I, it's like kind of part of my DNA, I think. And, um, and I, I, it's not something that I can really like turn off. It's, it, that part of it can be pretty tricky because Another example is the one of the last stories, that, one of the most recent stories that I did was about um, people who are facing eviction in a time of coronavirus. So there's a public health pandemic and their landlords are trying to kick them out of their apartments or houses. And I talked to three people, um, a single mother, a college student, and a, a man who repairs cars. And you know, all three of them were just like at their wits end, like, what am I going to do? Right. So when I, especially when I talked to the single mother, because I'm a mom and I, I, it's like, it really hurts you. It, it can really hurt in your heart um, to know that there are people suffering. And, you know, there are certain jobs where you just get exposed to that to a high degree. And like we were talking about earlier, um, it can really wear on you and it can make you pretty sad that this is happening and you sort of feel a little powerless like what can I as an individual do and and I think you have to keep your eye on the fact that there are there are lots of reporters out there trying to do the same thing and and maybe like one story isn't going to make a difference but if you look at the whole body of work of everyone's reporting on these topics, on inequality, for instance, income inequality, racial inequality, um, that hopefully that will move the needle a little bit, you know? So yeah, it, it can be hard when you're an empathetic person to make these phone calls, um, but yeah, Dave's right. It, uh, <laughs> that is something that, and it, you know, it's a blessing and a curse, so. Mm -hmm. No, that's awesome. Um, and I guess like, through your work, what's the most interesting insight that you've gained? And I guess like, what's one thing that most people don't really know about that you think you've gained through your work? Oh man, that's a deep question. Um, I would say that, I would say that there are just, so many types of people in the world and and I think that a lot of people are quick to judge and are quick to pass judgment on people and to criticize people but I don't think that a lot of people are able to put themselves into the shoes of another human being and I think that's what this has done for me is this has put me into the shoes of so many different kinds of people and it gives me an insight and perspective that I think, I wish everyone could feel this way. I wish everyone could, could see this, see the world through other people's eyes because I think that we would all be a lot kinder to each other. And I think we would try to fix more problems instead of just bickering over uh, politics. I see. And I guess like, 
you talked about having empathy for those who are being adversely affected by these, um, I guess, like scandals. But do you ever find yourself identifying with the, I guess, like the perpetrators of these? So, not really. <laughs> not really. No, I don't. Um, I mean, I, you know, I, I'm trying to think of an example of a story that I did when it was sort of like, uh, mm -hmm. this is, that usually there are shades of gray in stories. It's not black and white. It's not like either or. It's it, So there's a lot of nuance. And so that's why you always, even if something at face value looks like, oh, this is a clear indication. This is a clear cut and dried story about uh, someone stealing money from older people. Um, you know, when you, re when you reach out, you always have to, talk to the other people because you know what's what's the reason why are you doing this most of the time I don't get a good answer <laughs> but uh, you know but so in the instance of the telemarketer their their rationale was oh well raising money with telemarketers is very it's a very time intensive it's very expensive because you have to hire all these people and they're sitting in a phone room and they're making phone calls and it just costs a lot of money and so then, then you take that bit of information and you include it in your story because that's fair, because that's their rationale. That's like, oh, that's why they're keeping nine out of every $10. That's what they say. But then you go a little further and you do some research and you find out that, oh, well, actually there are telemarketers out there that only keep uh, five out of every $10 or six out of every $10. So, you know, so you, and you point that out too. Uh, I don't know. I think that's like a long way of saying that, um, I, uh, I can't really think of, um, you just have to try really hard to make sure you get everyone's viewpoint in your story, whether you agree with them or not. Mm -hmm. I see. And I guess, do you like, what are the types of moments where you realize that like all of my work was worth it? Actually, I just had one of those last week. And the, uh, I wrote a story in 2017. So three years ago, I wrote two stories. One was about a man who was based kind of like in Virginia near where I live. Um, and he was raising money for veterans charities and he had three veterans charities. And then I, the second story that I wrote was about the telemarketer who was raising money for that man and a bunch of other charities. So this was three years ago. This is separate from the Las Vegas guy. This is a different guy. Um, three years ago, I wrote that. It took that long before anything happened. And just last week, the Federal Trade Commission, um, the FTC, and attorneys general in four states jointly filed a lawsuit against that telemarketer and shut him down and banned him from fundraising forever. And, uh, and also like levied a huge fine against him. So to me, that's, that's a moment when you're like, okay, someone was listening, someone paid attention. And now hopefully people like that lady in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, aren't going to get as many phone calls. I'm sure she'll still hit phone calls from other people, but you know, at least this one operation, this one ring is has it got shut down so yeah that makes me feel like okay yeah that it, it was worth it yeah that's amazing and I guess like do you ever have like the victims themselves reach out to you to thank you for your work yes I have um especially uh yes absolutely there I wrote a lot of stories in um when I was at the Richmond Times Dispatch about uh, a man who a 20 four-year-old who essentially starved to death in a Virginia jail. And I did a series of more than 20 stories investigating the jail. And um, I had a reporting partner and we, we did this together. And um, that family was so thankful. Um, that family was just like, because they, they felt powerless. Like what, what could they do? They're, the son had died in jail, and he had only, he had 
allegedly stolen five dollars worth of snacks from a convenience store down the street from his home he was mentally ill and they basically just let him starve to death in jail so yeah that you know moments like that when those people reach out to you you feel like this huge connection to them like okay i am i i have a i have a megaphone and i'm going to talk about why did this happen what can be done to prevent this from happening in the future who is accountable that's amazing and um i guess like pulling this back to the gen z um theme of this podcast so it, when you imagine gen z i guess like inheriting the next era of investigative journalism how do you see their approach to journalism differing like do you think that they'll like tackle different topics um or like do you think the same topics will rec- like will repeatedly come up or like are there like inherently different views on what the like different generations might cover or um is it just like sim- simply covering new scandals as they come up So I think Gen Z is going to do a much better job of covering inequality than our generation has done. I think, see my kid again, sorry. Um, I think that that, um, Gen Z is more aware and uh, I think just has, has just more awareness and isn't ingrained. I mean, I think that like, the the older generations i'm like on the i'm like right between millennial and um gen x like right there in between so i'm like either a really old millennial or a really young gen xer i don't know but uh so i think that like our our generations haven't we haven't done a good enough job paying attention to income inequality and racial inequality in our country and i think that like hopefully your generation is going to pick up the torch and really push on that. And I also think that technology wise, um, I think that you guys are going to really just blow us out of the water when it comes to um, data, document diving, um, and using technology to report and, you know, reaching out to people to contact, you know, finding sources to talk to in this world. People don't have landlines anymore. No one has. And that's how, I'm sorry. She's like, I'm so sorry. Uh, she's just brand new so she's like really needy um people uh i think like our generation we we, you know i started in 2004 and like we had paper phone books (laughs) okay and we called people on their landlines through paper phone books like that is not a thing anymore and i think that uh your generation is just going to be so much more adept at technology Understood. All right. Thank you so much, Sarah, for joining me here today. That was an awesome conversation. I loved it. Thank um, you. You asked some amazing questions, like uh, really, you. really great questions. Um, so stay healthy, uh, stay safe, and I'll see everybody next time on Inside Politics. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. This is Christina. Thank you so much for watching Inside Politics. And please feel free to check out the rest of the interviews on my channel. See you next time.